Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 27, verses 27 through 44, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And then they had... And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The rebels who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. Oh, how many saw that during the Super Bowl? Um, came on. I, I don't know about you. I actually got tears in my eyes when I watched that. Because how many of you are sick of that? And the amazing thing to me is, whatever you think of the organization that put this out, there's a sincere irony to people coming out and criticizing that group for the things they believe in. Um, I I can't say I agree 100% with them, but that message speaks to our hearts the way we often hear Jesus speak to our hearts. So I, I see Jesus in that, don't you? Who's sick of it? What the world needs now isn't airtight, systemic theology. That's why I have a great hope for the United Methodist Church, because John Wesley never had a systemic theology. He had a practical theology. I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Our world doesn't need convincing apologetics clever comebacks, logical traps. Our world doesn't need forced morality in our laws. This world doesn't need another you're wrong, I'm right argument. It needs Christ-like unconditional love. It needs a love that says, I will love you No matter if you embrace me or you beat me, ignore me or whip me or nail me to a cross and leave me to die. Break me, it will not change my love for you. Uh, That's a deep love and that's the love God came to show us and reveal in his son. I love this line from... uh, One of Rich Mullins' songs, we have a love that's not as patient as yours was. Still, we do love now and then. And it's time for Christians to love. We have, as a whole, spent a lot of time pointing out what is wrong in the world. And certainly, the world is an easy target, isn't it? Most of us are an easy target when it comes down to it. 
It's not hard to point out what is wrong. What is hard is to point out what is right in our enemies, in those we disagree with, in those we may dislike. God's love is a love that is unchanging. I don't know if you've ever experienced the love of a a parent or a grandparent or uh, someone special in your life who no matter what you did, you knew they were going to love you. No matter how rotten you behaved or how badly you messed things up, their love was going to be there. They might not be happy with you, but their love wasn't going to change. That's the kind of love that will transform the world. Not a love that points out what's wrong. There's plenty of people to do that. Uh, I was 13 years old, and my dad thought it would be good for me to start working on my grandparents' farm. That's exactly what a junior high boy wants to do during a summer vacation. Um, I will admit, looking back, I was becoming a bit of a punk, you know, uh, and trying to grow my hair out long and just be rebellious. Um, You know, nothing wrong with long hair on a guy, but I was doing it to be a punk, you know, let's just be honest. And uh, dad thought some hard work would cure me of that, and grandma and grandpa's farm was just a mile down the road. So that's where I spent my summers. And uh, while I hated every minute of it then, I wouldn't trade those days. Well, I say I, I complained about it, but I found a source of pride there that I had not known before as a young man, working on that farm and seeing what I could accomplish. And grandma and grandpa... You know, grandmas and grandpas are loving and kind, and they set out cookies. And then there's those grandmas and grandpas that treat you like a hired hand, and that's what I had. Um, But in a loving way, they expected everybody to work hard. And I can remember we went down to the corner store in the little town of Lincolnville, and my grandmother wanted me to run in. It was at the end. We had been baling hay all day, and if you know what that's like when you're actually baling the hay, not just you know running a machine that puts a big roll in the field, but throwing it up and stacking it, you get chaff all over you. You're smelly. You're nasty. You're stinky. Uh, you look a wreck. And we pulled up, and there were all my buddies with their shiny bikes and their sharp clothes, hanging out in front of the corner store, trying to bump cigarettes off people. You know that kind of crew. And I was like, Grandma, I. I'm filthy, you know, I really don't want to go in there. Um, Look, those are, you know, those are my friends. I'm a little embarrassed how I look. And she looked at me, and I'd never seen my grandma get so mad in all my life. And she pointed a finger in my face, and she said to me, don't you ever be ashamed of how you look after an honest day of work. And I walked into that store a mile high. Because I didn't care what any of those punks cared about how I looked. My grandma had changed my perspective on who I was and the value of others' opinions because I valued her opinion over theirs. There's plenty of junior high boys sitting on the porch ready to point out what's wrong with us. The world doesn't need another bunch of those people. We got that guy, right? And you all can probably name him. What the world needs right now is a a Grandma Barton. What the world needs now is somebody that, despite how filthy and nasty we might have made ourselves look on the inside and on the outside, can look at us and say, you are a child of God. You have worth. And every time we pass along that stinging Facebook post or repeat that argument we heard on our favorite news um, network, every time we do this, we are piling on to the whips that hit the Savior's back. We are piling on to the jeers that cried out to the Creator on the cross. We are piling on. We are piling on. (coughs) And the church, for some reason, has thought for a while that its righteous indignation gives it a right to belittle other people, and it just doesn't. Or it gives us the right to call out in them what we think is wrong and how we think they ought to behave. And that's not the gospel I've read. In fact, it is the people who do that very thing that we see Jesus get so irate with. 
And so when Jesus had every right to come down from the cross or call down a legion of angels or to tell his disciples to draw their swords, when he had every right to do so, what were his words in response? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He neither confronted his enemies with clever arguments, nor did he confess they were right. He simply stated a position of love. He didn't get involved in culture wars. When they brought him the emperor's coin, he dismissed it. When they asked about temple taxes, he dismissed it. When they asked who has authority, he dismissed it. But everything he did projected a value of loving others and going to an extreme to represent it. Uh, We are called to be Christians who stand in the middle. And standing in the middle is not an easy place to do. So no wonder uh, the, the American church today hasn't had a taste for that for a long time. Because standing in the middle, um, it, it reminds me of the, um, I'll show my age a little bit, I love the, the original Karate Kid, you know. Came out in the 80s and... Uh, Mr. Miyagi and Danielson, and he asked Danielson, are you ready? And Danielson says, I guess so. And he says to him, walk left side, safe. Walk right side, safe. Walk in the middle, sooner or later, squish like grape. No, I guess so. But that's exactly where we're called to walk as Christians to be that vulnerable person that stands in the middle, that loves both sides of the aisle, however you define those aisles, to stand in the middle and call out the value and worth in both. And probably if you're on one side or the other, you go, boy, that's going to be a hard task. But it's there. Trust me. We've been called to love. There's a wonderful friendship um, that I'd like to kind of highlight. Nadia Bowles Weber, if you don't know her, she's a Lutheran pastor. Um, she's the one there with sleeved out tattoos, um, arms. And uh, she's kind of a radical. And, and you know, in the early 2000s, she kind of came to fame with her message and uh, had a church where. Uh, uh, drag queens and transgendered people would attend and were active in the church. And she drew some attention because of that. And a lot of it was negative. And uh, nobody was more negative on her than this gentleman here, um, Chris Rosenbrau. Uh He called himself the Pirate Christian. He had a podcast and other news uh, uh, venues in which he lambasted her over and over again. Until one day they met. For whatever reason, Chris was at one of her uh, seminars and decided to listen in on Nadia's talk. And afterwards, felt a nudge from God to go and introduce himself to Nadia. So that's exactly what he did. Uh, Nadia uses some uh, colorful language I won't use in her book describing this event, but she basically wanted to tell him to go somewhere else when she met him. But she said, I kept my tongue shut my mouth shut, and I listened to the Spirit, and I listened to what he had to say, and he asked, would you like to come and sit down and have a talk? And She agreed. And they sat down and began to share their, their life story and how Christ had worked in their lives, their own brokenness, and somehow they became very transparent and vulnerable with each other. At the end of the conversation, Nadia said to Chris, Chris, I have two things to say to you. One, you're a beautiful child of God. This is, these are two people that have been kind of shooting arrows back and forth at each other from a distance on social media for some time. Second, I think that maybe you're desperate enough to hear the gospel that we can even hear it from each other. I love that line. Uh, later, Chris posted on his Facebook page uh, a picture of himself with Nadia and said, this is my good friend Nadia. And he, he, he pulled back on his You know, yeah, they still disagreed. They would call each other. They would kind of argue about things, but they respected each other and became good friends. 
And he posted a picture of himself with Nadia, and he got a lot of criticism on, on social media and out there. And uh, Nadia was following it, and she sent him this gracious response that said, Honey, it's pretty rough out there. If you need to renounce our friendship in public, I would totally understand and still be your friend in private. And that kind of, just a wonderful person. And here's what his response was, which I thought is fantastic. Never. If being your friend is a sin, it's still worth it. Are we a people that's willing to stand in that middle? To offer Christ-like unconditional love. And we see all the political signs going up, and we know how divisive those have been in the past. Not so much in local elections, so somewhat. But we know how divisive we have been, personally. Again, the world's an easy target. Instead of pointing out what's wrong in the world, let's begin seeking how we can point out what is right. And we look at this story even in, in Matthew's gospel, even the thieves that were on either side of Christ jeered him. The Pharisees felt like they had victory. The establishment, Rome, used their force to crush him and used their power to beat him. Yet it's not when Christians have demanded their rights, but rather when they have given them up like their savior, that they have been a redemptive force in culture. In the later part of the Roman Empire, um, an epidemic struck. It was a plague, and today, looking back at it, <coughs> with modern science, we seem to believe it was the scarlet fever, but um, much of the Roman uh, population was decimated. And this is during the time when Christian persecution was at its height. Christians were being killed in the arenas for amusement, but the arenas shut down because everybody was dealing with this epidemic, this pandemic of a sorts. An article by Layman Stone argues that it was during this time that Rome became Christian because what happened was those Christians who were in hiding those Christians who had been persecuted, sought out, and killed, came out of the woodwork and began treating those who were dying, became vulnerable in their love, came to the community that sought to sacrifice them, and instead offered care. John Wesley never set up a systemic theology that said, this is right, this is wrong. What he did set up was a practical theology that sought to speak God's grace and love into the community, into the lives of our friends and neighbors, our family, and yes, even our enemies. So when we look at the world around us and how so many are behaving. I've got one more clip from the He Gets Us uh, venue. Maybe you've seen this. I love this one, and this is how we'll close our message today. I don't know about you, but... Um, I'm tired of trying to be right. I just want to be loving. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now let's pray. Lord, help us to get our hearts right with you. That we might love the way you would call us to love. To behave the way you would have us behave like children. Children aren't so much worried about if they're right or not, but they care if people love them and how to show that love. Help us to be children. It's in your name we pray. Amen.